Hi, uh, welcome to the new voting project. My name is Kunal, your host. Um, we're still looking for an alternative host in case some viewers, you know, don't like me, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, today we're here with Amar Shergill, um, a trial attorney and the California Democratic Party's Progressive Chair Caucus. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. I understand you're very busy, um, you're saving the world and whatnot. So thank you so much, Amar, I do appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure to be here. You know, did just to finish up doing some text banking for uh, Nina Turner out in Ohio, and maybe we'll try to get in some calls for her later, but uh, I'm happy to be here. Perfect, perfect. Thank you so much. Let's dive into these questions. Um, so just for our viewers, um, talk a little bit about your background, you know, what got you interested in politics, um, what you've done or do for the state of California's Democratic Party as the Progressive Caucus Chair, and just as a side note, touch on how college prepared you to take on these, these very complicated roles. Wow, so this, that is uh, a, loaded a, a, a huge question. It's like six or seven uh, <laughs> questions in there, but let's, uh, let's back it up. Um, what got me started in uh, politics? So I've always been uh, politically aware, I guess, uh, you know, from a young age, um, but really what got me involved in my community and in the Democratic Party and electoral politics is, uh, you know, it's not a, a, a particularly new story, but it is a common one. And I have, I have three kids and they, you know, they're two in college now and one in high school. But whack, back when I got uh, started, it was just, uh, you know, when they were just a little, a couple of years old, and I looked around and thought that, you know what, I could be doing more to uh, make this community a better one for them to grow up in. And uh, so I started getting involved uh, here locally. Uh, one of the triggers was the two uh, sick grandfathers in my community were murdered. So they were turban wearing six out in, on uh, a walk and uh, they were murdered and the culprits were never found. And uh, one of the things that we realized then is as a sick, you know, as a faith-based community that I'm from, and for South Asians, we just did not have enough people uh, stepping up in civic engagement. And what I knew is that I had a ton of privilege as an attorney, as a trial lawyer, the community had done a lot to take care of me growing up and um, also now in my practice. So it was time for me to lean in and I took the leadership role and uh, making sure that we established some of the organizations and infrastructure that could allow us and our voice to be heard. So whether it's uh, on the board at uh, Gurdwara, which is a place of worship right. um, and getting them engaged and involved or in a political action committee or nonprofit. And, and once you get involved with your community, then things really start to yeah. uh, domino yeah. after yeah. that. And uh, as I became involved more and more in the Democratic Party, what I realized is that there are a lot of problems in the Democratic Party and that um, as much as we might uh, know on the streets what the good policies are and where the suffering is and the policies that alleviate suffering, uh, the Democratic Party often wasn't responsive. And one of the main reasons was that it, there's just so much corporate money flooding into the party and so few ways for candidates to put that money aside and uh, you know do what's right for the people. So I was uh, part of you know the movement that uh, Bernie Sanders helped trigger and lead um, to try to get rid of corporate money and corporate fueled uh, policies and return the party to the people. And we're still struggling with that. Right. But uh, I guess that's the beginning of your of, uh, an answer to your question. I think you had some more questions in there. I might have lost them. Yeah, no, um, really after that, um, touch on how your college education kind of prepared you uh, for your roles. I guess as an attorney, you know, you kind of need to go to law school or something like that. <laughs> so maybe talk a little bit about your educational experience. Yeah, so politics is really all about communication, whether you are having the conversations with people um, in your neighborhood, on the streets, knocking door to door, or whether you know, you're drafting um, you know, talking points on legislation, or um, you know, you're whether you're making speeches on a mic to thousands of people. It, this is all a communications game. And um, I'm blessed that 
you know, through my upbringing and through public schools and then through law school, I've really been able to sharpen my skills as a communicator. And that's, you can't always tell that on Zoom, but right. um, a lot of that is, you know, taking a look at all these different diverse sources of information, um, looking at them quickly, seeing what's important. Um, collating that and then putting out a message that puts it all together. So when you're leading an organization like the Progressive Caucus and the California Democratic Party, I'm doing a lot of that where I'm um, taking a look at documents, you know, creating whether it's a tweet or a policy position or a press statement. You're pretty big uh, on Twitter. Well, <laughs> I'll, be liking, I'll be liking your posts. Yeah, I don't know that my uh, following is that big, but I'm trying to get into it more because like we're saying, you know, communicating, um, on Twitter is uh, is important because that's where a lot of people are. Right. So um, at least for me, I would say that you know law school has made that type of communication uh, pretty easy. Um, but I don't think you need to go to law school to be good at this kind of stuff. If you're willing to do the work and you're willing to talk to your neighbors, um, you can be very valuable in the movement. And we all find a place. You know, if that's something that uh, you're not comfortable with. There are plenty of ways to be involved um, that you know match your skill set, and I have yet to meet anybody in the movement who hasn't found a place, a niche where they can feel valuable. Right. Yeah. No. I still I feel pretty valuable. You know. Um, anyways, it's not always about me. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, moving on, you know, kind of from your start in politics, let's take it back a year, um, twenty twenty once in a century pandemic hits the United States, all over the world really. Um, and then we have a very, very politicized and polarized election happening concurrently. Um, and I just wanted to ask, what were your thoughts on last year's elections, federal, state, maybe municipal, you know, I was involved at the regional level where I live in the East Bay. Um, kind of talk, you know, walk me through your, through your thoughts on, on last year. Yeah, you know what? Um, it has been an interesting time uh, for politics. You know, they say uh, there's a curse that says, may you live in interesting times. Right. The idea being that if things are peaceful, that probably is more conductive to your happiness. Right. But um, it has been interesting, that's for sure. And we are, we are blessed that we got rid of Trump and we are blessed that in California, we continue to be successful in electing Democrats and keeping the majority in the state house and a democratic governor. But um, that success often papers over and obscures um, some of the fundamental problems which we see in California and really across the nation. You know, we, we tend to you know, think of the big Biden win, right. but again, that was a very close election and it shouldn't have been. And what uh, the Democratic Party is still struggling to recognize is that there is a lot of distrust of institutions and party mechanisms because we so often do what is not good for the people. And you know, last night was a pretty good example. We have an eviction moratorium right. federal that's about to lift. We have what some see as 7 million odd people that could be evicted, put on the streets, for something that they really had no control over, right? They just didn't have income during the pandemic. They got laid off, there were additional expenses. They got sick, they didn't have health insurance, whatever it is. And the Congress went home. Yeah. And um, they didn't take care of it. They didn't even have a vote. They didn't even take it up. And, you know, those type of things have been happening for decades. And we see people that are just fed up with it. And that's why more and more we have folks that are being elected that are clearly progressive, right? Jamal Bowman and AOC and so many others and Bernie Sanders, obviously, um, across the country. Um, and we need to do more of that. So 2020, yes, we won. We did our job and I worked as hard uh, as a lot of people to make sure Joe Biden was the next president because we need a Democrat in the White House. But that's also clearly not enough. And we've got a ton of work ahead of us. And I continue to do that inside the Democratic Party and uh, without. But um, anybody who looks at 2020 and says that the job is done, it just isn't looking hard enough. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and I guess the, the main focus of this channel is supposed to talk about voting rights. 
Um, obviously, it's an issue um, that everyone around the country is talking about. Um, how important is voting? Let's start with that question. <laughs> and then let me give you the questions following. Look, voting's everything. I mean, that's where it all starts and begins. If um, even in your local mayoral election, if you are denied the right to vote, that is probably the position which can most touch your life day to day. And if the policies there aren't uh, those that are friendly to people of color, to diverse groups, to women, um, that affects everything. You take a look at your, you know, your local uh, city council. If they aren't establishing policies that are ensuring that the workforces in the local government are not diverse and representative of the community, they will retain wealth for a homogenous group. And that means you have people out in your community who just can't earn the same money as their counterparts. And those are the building blocks, right? So if it, if it happens in, in your, your local city council and it translates to the county and all the way up to uh, the presidency, it prevents us from building the community um, based on equity. Right. And when we don't have communities based, in, based on equity, what we see are policies that cause human suffering for no good reason, whether that's climate change or it's incarceration, um, you know, or any number of others uh, that cause people to suffer. Um, we need uh, voting rights, civil rights to be uh, protected in every square inch of this nation so that the policies um, reflect the communities that vote. When people are denied access to the vote, we see a direct line between that and uh, legislatures and policymakers that uh, you know enact policies that enrich the very wealthy and the mega corporations and leave uh, average working people um, to suffer and to just be barely able to scrape together what they need um, to raise their families. So, you know, it all starts and ends in voting. And it's just so disappointing right now to see a lot of states mm -hmm. um, where they're attacking the right to vote. Right. And then uh, federally, where we just haven't built the coalition yet um, to ensure that we, um, you know, protect those rights uh, across the country. Right, right. And I guess following that tangent, would you, or, you know, is there a progressive idea of allowing, you know, folks like me, I'm 17, I'll be voting in my first election next year, um, you know, for the primaries in the general. Um, should 16, should 17 year olds be allowed to cast a ballot, you know, for their local municipal elections you talked about, their school board, you know, who's forming their education policies? Should that, is, is that a critical issue that also needs to be discussed when it comes to voting rights? Yeah, I support lowering the voting age. I mean, the, a lot of times the the argument that folks throw out, and they're almost always old folk, is that, um, hey, kids don't understand, or they haven't developed the maturity to make these types of decisions. But I'm looking around the electorate and seeing what type of decisions that supposedly mature folk make, and they're horrible. And then I take a look at what um, you know the younger generation is doing and their activism and the way they understand politics and the amount of information they're taking in. And it's a no brainer that uh, folks that are 16 and 17 are certainly capable and aware enough to exercise the franchise. And when we take a look across the country at organizations that are making a difference, that are sophisticated and strategic, um, Sunrise, March for Our Lives and others are doing the work to change the conversation probably more than all of these adult organizations have done uh, for decades. Right. So, um, you know, I trust uh, younger folks to vote and to organize and to be strategic and to get it right. So I, I say, you know, whatever we can and certainly start with school board elections. I mean, there's a direct line between um, students and the folks that represent them on the school board. Why not do as many students um, votes in school board elections as we can? Right. Yeah. And I'm glad you trust me because, you know, I am the epitome of the gender. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, yeah, those, those are all answers. I think we need to start that conversation, you know. Um, 
I guess for you, more, more, more towards you, do you have any aspirations to run for, for an elected office beyond what you have right now? No, I don't think so. I'm a good with the- You know, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I know, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. But you know what? We all have our places where we fit. And for me, what fits is uh, activism within the party. So um, I'm very happy that, um, you know, the, the things that have, you know, led to me being in the party make me an effective advocate within the party. Because let's be frank, is that within the party, uh, whether it's California Democratic Party or the National Party, um, we see a lot of folks that are concerned about protecting their own little uh, piece of the pie right. and their income and advancement. Um, but what we traditionally have seen less of are folks that are immune to the usual um, pressure points and can be active simply um, on issues which you know help uh, working people and we're seeing more and more of those in the party now the same struggles that we see in electoral politics we see within the party um and i'm happy to help uh, lead that so um i think i'm in a good spot okay all right well you know things change people change sometimes yeah things can change you never know particularly you know my kids are, are growing up and maybe if they go off to college and i got a ton of time here uh, you never know yeah no being a trial attorney is not a bad job <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my work keeps me busy. I haven't talked about that much, but yeah, I represent people that are uh, injured in car accidents, wrongful death cases, and yeah, that keeps me busy too. Yeah, yeah, I'd hope so. Um, and I guess in closing, um, what would you recommend to my generation? I guess the umbrella term is Gen Z, um, Generation Z. That's what we call ourselves, apparently. I didn't agree to these terms, but they were given to me. Yeah. Um, what, what, what's your advice you know, when it comes to politics, when it comes to getting engaged, getting involved? What would you tell us to do, not only as the next flight of voters, but the next flight of people who are going to inherit, you know, decades worth of political issues and, you know, climate change to start? Yeah, you know, the most important thing is that your efforts uh, will make a difference. And when we think around the country that these uh, you know, uh, social media superstars who have millions of followers, whether it's AOC or Ro Khanna or whomever else. Um, they started with just a small group of people. And uh, very few of these people get, you know, run out of the gate um, with massive followings. But um, what is true is that every single piece of political activism I've been involved in started with you know, four, five, 10 people and conversations in a home or a backyard or uh, at a restaurant or with Starbucks or whatever, of people who recognize a problem in their community and decide they want to be involved and do the work. And if you do the work, other people recognize you doing the work and you'll be able to um, develop the coalitions which solve larger problems. Right. And you know, you might identify something in your community, um, like for instance, here in Elk Grove and where I live and a lot of places around the country, um, people started targeting the fact that we, that places didn't have by district elections, meaning that the person in your small city council was elected only by the people in your small city council. Right. There were a lot of places where, uh, you know, uh, districts were large, you couldn't tell who represented you, and the votes were obscured and a small group of people was electing um, count a city council or a mayor. And what we see now in the Sacramento area and across California is that is almost completely gone, where now every small district is entirely connected to the people that live in that district. And that makes um, all governments more responsive. Right. And every one of those campaigns, it's just like four or five, 10 people who started it. And, you know, if we take a look at larger campaigns, which is, you know, say the Bernie Sanders campaign, say, oh, yeah, there's these massive, you know, large dollar, massive amounts of small dollar contributions that come in to fund these million dollar campaigns. But when you um, zero in, you target, you look at these small communities, every one of them is just a group, five, six, 10 people that got out, knocked on doors, convinced their neighbors, those neighbors convinced uh, their family members and friends. And with that, 
Bernie Sanders won the presidential primary in California and a lot of other states. If we replicate that, if we do it over and over again, if you do it in your community, um, you can be the difference. And then, you know, you'll, people will turn to you as a leader in your community. We see younger and younger leaders every day. And quite frankly, that's the future of the nation because um, old folks have not done a very good job. Right. Let's be frank. Right. Yeah. I'm not saying I agree with that, but yes, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, you should agree with it. Let's look around. I mean, the the California's on fire. The state is having the state and the, the nation and the planet are breaking heat records every day. So a couple of weeks ago, we had over a thousand people die on the West Coast just because they could not escape temperatures. And that is a direct um, result of what old people have been doing for a long time. So when people say to me, um, you know, should more youth get involved and can they make a difference? I say they can, and really they're our best hope. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for placing your hopes in me. Um, <laughs> no, but yes, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I actually wanna ask you one last question. Yeah, sure. How, what, what, is, what is the definition of being a progressive activist? You know, how do you define progressivism, I guess, in, in the modern century? You know, it's a tough question, particularly because, um, you know, diff it means different things to different people. Right. And the particular problem is that folks that clearly are not progressive will say they are because they want to sound progressive so that people who are progressive will um, consider them. And so... So here's what I would say in a, in a simple nutshell, is that you are progressive if you look at any policy issue, any problem in our nation, you identify who is suffering, the community and the people that are suffering, and you choose the solution which decreases human suffering without regard to profit, political interest, influence, your own personal advancement and uh, your own income. If you can do those things, you're progressive. If you allow you know, your next political um, campaign to creep in, if you allow uh, corporate money to creep in, if you allow centrist Republican ideology to creep in, if you try to compromise to make everybody happy, um, instead of just doing what's right, you're not progressive. Um, so, you know, from that, you can say progressives believe in Medicare for all, Green New Deal, end of the incarceration state, you know, stopping foreign wars, uh, equality for all people and equity for all people. And, uh, you know, a woman's right to a reproductive choice and control their own body. But every one of those really, is just a, a reaffirmation or a bit of a different spin on the one fundamental truth that progressives in all areas of political advocacy are trying to find the human suffering, the policy which solves it, and then advocate to ensure that it is uh, you know, turned into uh, real action. And, and that to me is progressive in, progressivism in a nutshell. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good answer, I'd have to say, yeah. You know, I, I would define progressivism as standing up for what you believe in, 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 in the context of, like you said, helping others, right? Identifying the problem, but not just identifying it, also attempting to solve it, whether with your own intuition or with the help of others, right? Building those coalitions. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I would just have to say, you know, I, I commend you for, for your work as Progressive Caucus Chair, because trust me, we hear it down the grapevine. You, you know, I know you're in Elk Grove, but we hear it over here. You know, we support you for the work you do. Um, you know, please let us know if, if there's any other way to do that uh, beyond just campaigning. Um, but yes, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're always welcome back, Amar, anytime you want to talk. Um, and yeah, please, please keep doing what you do. No, thank you. I, I appreciate it. But it, it must be said that the work I do 
is uh, only because of folks voted for me and folks that uh, organize with me and community members uh, across the state. And it, it's also a function of a lot of privilege, right? Is that I've been able to get an education because of public schools. And, um, you know, I was raised by a community of folks because my father passed away when I was very young. And, you know, I've been able through community support to have uh, an income where I can raise my family. And all of those things come together to make me uh, have the skill set um, to do the work and also immunity from the normal political pressures. And, uh, you know, so, so I just thank really all of those people that help uh, lift me up and bring me to this position so that I can uh, give back. And yeah, it, you know, we get into some troublemaking and we yeah. uh, piss some people off. Oh yeah, and, like the Attorney General of, of California and sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I don't know if we have time for that story, but I'm happy to tell it. But yeah, if it's the Attorney General or the Governor or the President or the State Chair um, of our party, it def doesn't really matter to me who's upset so long as the people that um, you know really need help the most are getting closer to a society built in equity and uh, and that's all that I'm about. Yeah, no, and I believe it. Um, yeah, no, I, I will link your socials down below. People can directly see what, what you post about our Democratic Party. Um, and of course, follow you, you do follow back. Thanks for that, by the way. Really proud of you following me back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, no, I, 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 hope, I hope you and wish you the best of luck and you're always welcome back. Thanks, Colin. Of course, take care, man. All right, take care.